from the beginning of the next ice age. But this time around, some of the things we're doing ourselves are accelerating the process which is leading to the next ice age. As a result of these combined devastations, the majority of people on Earth, in every region, may die of starvation in less than a decade. And that the long 15-year drought in Northern Africa, which has already resulted in so much starvation, is only the beginning of what may become the greatest holocaust in the history of the planet. We are often told about the disastrous consequences of the greenhouse effect, but we're not informed as to how soon and quickly this might occur. But there are things that can be done to prevent this new ice age and the terrible dire effects. We'll talk about that right now on Alternative Views. <laughs> to an all-out nuclear war, perhaps the worst thing that can happen to the human species is a new ice age. The Institute for a Future in Kensington, California has been studying this, and they've produced a documentary on the subject which they're allowing us to share with you on alternative views. Most of our climate here on Earth has been friendly for the last few thousand years. But during most of the past three million years, the Earth has been much colder than it is now. And the regions where most of our food comes from were too cold to grow any food at all. Scientists have recently discovered that there has been a long series of recurring ice ages in the last few million years, with relatively brief periods of warmth in between. Each of these ice ages has lasted about 90,000 years on the average while the warm interglacial periods between ice ages have averaged only about 10,000 years. This long cycle of major ice ages, approximately every 100,000 years, suggests that we can expect another one sometime soon. But what does soon mean in ice age time? And how much warning are we likely to have? And is there anything we could do about it even if we had some warning? Recent studies of ancient ice deposits and of underground layers of pollen from trees that lived 100,000 years ago suggest that last time, the final transition from a warm to an ice age climate happened incredibly fast. Not over thousands or even hundreds of years, but in less than 20 years. When the shift occurs, the climate in many regions of the Earth cools very quickly. Fruit and nut trees that need warm weather no longer grow in many temperate regions, and they are replaced by the kinds of trees now found only in areas like northern Sweden and Alaska. The glaciers will take many thousands of years to reach their maximum point, but the climate cools so suddenly that agriculture almost instantly becomes all but impossible in most regions of the Earth. Some recent evidence suggests that we may now be more than halfway through such a rapid, perhaps less than 20 year transition period. And that we may be less than seven years away from the beginning of the next ice age. What could possibly cause a cycle of ice ages which recur every 100,000 years? Up until recently, many scientists have believed that the major ice ages are caused by very small changes in the Earth's orbit over tens of thousands of years. Changes which have minute effects on the amount of sunlight reaching various parts of the globe. Some of these orbital movements do seem to cause relatively minor fluctuations in ice cover on the Earth 
But the small variation in the Earth's orbit around the Sun, which very slightly narrows and widens on a 100,000 year time frame, produces changes in sunlight which are so minute, on the order of half of 1%, that many scientists now feel that this is not likely to be the cause of such enormous phenomena as the major ice ages. This orbital theory assumes that something has to cool the Earth in order to bring on an ice age. But Sir George Simpson, who was the head of Britain's Royal Meteorological Society, had a different idea. Fifty years ago, he published a paper in which he suggested that some source of increased energy would be needed to move the huge amounts of moisture which build up the glaciers of an ice age. Presumably, most of this moisture comes from the oceans. But where would the increased energy come from? Sir George thought that the sun's brightness must change in some cyclical way over tens of thousands of years, but there has never been any evidence for this. Now another scientist has come up with a more plausible source of that energy. John Hamaker is a mechanical engineer trained at Purdue University who has been studying climate from a very multidisciplinary perspective for the past 15 years. Hamaker believes the energy to build up the Ice Age glaciers comes from a greenhouse effect. A hundred years ago, when industry was spewing out the dirty waste products of coal, and then oil burning in great quantities, scientists began theorizing that the excess carbon dioxide from such massive burning of long-buried fossil fuels would trap additional heat from the sun and cause a greenhouse effect, which would eventually warm up the Earth's climate. Since we've been burning fossil fuels in enormous and ever-increasing quantities ever since, some climatologists have theorized that a greenhouse warming will eventually warm the Earth substantially, and that this would eventually melt the polar ice caps, which would raise sea level and flood coastal cities all over the Earth. But carbon dioxide, CO2, has been dramatically increasing in the atmosphere for more than a hundred years, and there is little evidence of any global warming in all this time. In fact, northern hemisphere winters have been colder during many of the last 15 years than in all of recorded history. Florida citrus crops used to freeze about one year every decade. They froze four of the five years from 1980 to 85. New records have been broken over and over again almost every winter in the past few years. John Hemmaker points out that the greenhouse effect has to occur most strongly in the tropics, since that is the area which already gets the most sunlight. The poles in higher latitudes, which get relatively few of the sun's rays, they're even dark much of the year, should be warmed very little by a greenhouse effect. When the tropics heat up and the poles don't change much, the temperature difference between these two areas of the globe increases. And when that occurs, any meteorologist can tell you what will happen. It might very well be that the number of hurricanes would increase. And the number of tornadoes, not only will they increase, but the intensities might be greater. In fact, hurricanes and tornadoes seem to be increasing dramatically in the last few decades. Some of the difference may be due to more complete reporting, since there are now more people to spot such weather extremes and report them. But the huge increases in the number of tornadoes reported seem substantially greater than one would expect from a slowly increasing population. As the greenhouse effect heats up the already warm tropical oceans, additional water is evaporated, which forms more clouds. Some of this extra moisture gets picked up by the increasing wind systems that have developed and is moved far away. Hamaker believes that this process is responsible for the excessive rainfall the Northern Hemisphere seems to be experiencing in the last 10 to 15 years, which has caused some rivers to flood severely. And that this increased rainfall is what has caused some lakes to rise to record levels in recent years. This is Lake Michigan, which has begun to overflow its banks into parts of Chicago's lakefront neighborhoods. 
And this is the Great Salt Lake, which now covers the railroad tracks that used to run by it. As some of the new moisture-laden clouds are driven to high latitude and polar regions, they precipitate out as snow and ice, building up the polar glaciers. The average northern hemisphere snow cover increased enormously from 1967 to 1975. Since then, the area covered by spring snow cover has again reached record levels, freezing newly planted crops and turning millions of peaches and other fruit into ice cubes. Some scientists now believe that simply by producing more clouds that block the sun, a greenhouse effect makes the earth colder rather than warmer. Others believe that a sustained increase in cloudiness, whatever its source, could lead to an ice age. Many scientists besides Hamaker now believe that a greenhouse effect paradoxically is likely to lead to increased snow cover and the buildup of polar ice. But how could a greenhouse effect have been responsible for the previous ice ages in the cycle, all of which occurred long before we even existed? Science has long known that a great deal of erosion by wind and water takes place during the 10,000 years of each warm interglacial period. One of the major consequences is that the minerals in the soil get eroded away or leach deep into the subsoil where they can no longer be reached by the trees and other plant life. We now know that close to a hundred minerals, iron, calcium, magnesium, and many others, are essential nutrients for all plant and animal life. As the vital minerals in the soil get eroded away over thousands of years during the warm interglacial period, the Earth's temperate region forests get progressively weaker and eventually begin to die off. They succumb more readily to insects and disease and to forest fire. Svend Andersen, the great Danish climatologist, did a remarkable study a few years ago. Working at several lakes which had remained undisturbed for hundreds of thousands of years, he counted the grains of different kinds of pollen found at deeper and deeper layers of sediment as an indication of the types of trees which were growing in those places during the past 200,000 years. What he found was that the large shade trees, which need a greater quantity of soil minerals to thrive, began to quickly die back about halfway through the last warm interglacial period. He believed that the loss of soil minerals to erosion and leaching was the reason. And he found additional evidence for this view in the simultaneous increase of less vital plants, like ferns and heather, which typically grow on more acidic soils. Minerals buffer the soil against acidity, and when they are lost, the soil inevitably becomes more acid. Anderson discovered other evidence which supported his hypothesis, and he found a similar pattern at four different sites, representing not only the last interglacial, but the one before that as well. As the Earth's forests weaken and begin to die from the progressive loss of soil minerals, they stop consuming their great quantities of carbon dioxide and instead give it back to the atmosphere very quickly when they catch fire. Most forest fires are caused by lightning. The additional carbon dioxide created by this natural process would create a greenhouse effect which could periodically evaporate and move large quantities of tropical moisture to build up the glaciers, thus leading to the recurrent cycle of ice ages. And there's one last piece of this awesome puzzle. When the ice age comes and the glaciers slowly advance over thousands of years, they grind up the many types of rocks in their path into a fine dust. This rock dust is then blown by wind 
and carried by water over many parts of the earth. Rocks are made up of minerals, so this rock dust remineralizes much of the earth's soil. It nourishes the forest and other vegetation once more. As the forests become rejuvenated, they thrive and spread, and they consume the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. As the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere decreases, the greenhouse effect subsides, and with it the transfer of excess moisture to the high latitudes and polar regions, which build up the glaciers. The glaciers finally melt back, and another warm interglacial period begins. There is, seems to be quite a consensus about the fact that variability of climate is on the increase, and if this is so, the differential CO2 effect becomes more credible than the general warm-up that's advocated by those who model climate in computers. And this is a great service, I would suggest, that Hamaka has done, is to consider the whole first and try to understand how all the parts that in, are included into it, like the atmosphere, the oceans, the biosphere, the ice part of the globe, and all these things, how they really interact in order to make that, the climate understandable. I write the annual review of the environment for the Encyclopedia Britannica, and I have written several environmental studies textbooks. John Hamaker has developed a beautiful and comprehensive theory of climate change, every element of which is supported by scientific evidence. His theory has been sitting under the noses of many other scientists, but they have largely overlooked it. In my judgment, John Hamaker's theory is a major contribution to humanity. Here is a drawing of the whole system, the engine of the ice ages as proposed by John Hamaker. It starts with the demineralization of much of the world's soils by erosion and leaching, particularly in the temperate regions. When soils lose their minerals, the forests growing on them become weakened, and they consume less carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Then as they die, and sometimes catch fire and burn, their carbon is released back to the atmosphere in ever greater quantities. This excess carbon dioxide creates a greenhouse effect, trapping additional heat from the sun. Because the tropics get much more direct sunlight than the higher latitudes, they are warmed much more by the greenhouse effect. This warms up the tropical oceans and evaporates more moisture from them, which forms more clouds. The increasing temperature difference between the poles and the tropics creates a larger pressure difference as the warm air rises and the cold air rushes in to replace it. This circulates the air faster and produces higher winds. These winds move many of the new moisture-laden clouds towards the higher latitudes. In the mid-latitudes, they make the earth colder, and some of them precipitate out as additional rain, which may lead to more floods. Toward the high latitudes and the poles, some of these new clouds precipitate as increased snow and ice. The ice sheets and glaciers begin to build up, cooling the polar regions even more. This widens the temperature difference between the poles and the tropics still further, accelerating the process and building up ice sheets and glaciers still more. When large amounts of snow and ice build up in the polar regions, this added weight pressing down on the Earth's thin crust can cause slippages, which result in increasing numbers of earthquakes. This may also be happening in recent years. As the polar ice sheets expand and grow, and press down more on the molten layer just beneath the Earth's thin crust, this red-hot lava tends to squirt out in other places, like hydraulic fluid. The result is increasing volcanic eruptions as the ice age progresses. These eruptions spew out a great deal of additional carbon dioxide, 
together with sulfuric and other gases that acidify soils and destroy more forests, which send still more carbon dioxide into the air. Some scientists think that volcanic eruptions have already been increasing dramatically in recent decades. Think of Mount St. Helens, Mount Etna, and El Chichon, to name a few just since 1982. At some point, this system becomes self-perpetuating and irreversible, and another ice age, which will last some 90,000 years, is underway. We may be very close to that point right now. The 100,000-year cycle of ice ages is a natural process, one that has been occurring without any human contribution. But this time around, some of the things we're doing ourselves are accelerating the process which is leading to the next ice age. Our fossil fuel burning, coal, oil, gasoline, natural gas, is a very big contributor to the current greenhouse effect pouring out not only vast quantities of carbon dioxide, but other gases which contribute to the greenhouse effect, like carbon monoxide and nitrous oxide. Incinerating garbage produces some of these same greenhouse gases. All these massive amounts of burning are also the cause of acid rain, which poisons the soil and thus quickens the destruction of the world's forests. The tropical rainforests contain the most concentrated, rapidly growing vegetation on Earth. And we've been cutting them down at an ever accelerating rate. The Amazon basin in Brazil is the largest of the remaining rainforests on Earth. An area of Amazon rainforest the size of France is being clear cut every five years the equivalent of a football field every second. Tropical forests in Central and South America are often burned or bulldozed to clear land for more cattle ranching. Often these huge fires get out of control and burn vast numbers of trees covering thousands of square miles. 95% of the meat from these cattle ends up as cheap hamburgers that are sold and eaten in the United States. The meat is not needed, but fast food chains buy it because it's a little bit cheaper than buying cattle raised in America, about a nickel per hamburger cheaper. Pesticides and herbicides so toxic they are banned in the United States are often used on these cattle ranches where they get into the meat and come back in the burgers. The industrialized countries are destroying their own forest for short-term gain, too. Whole sections are clear-cut, resulting in erosion and the loss of precious topsoil. Modern warfare also takes a terrible toll on forests, sometimes deliberately, like the widespread use of Agent Orange in Vietnam. Several other gases produced by our own activities also contribute to the greenhouse effect. The enormous quantities of food garbage we produce gives off methane, another greenhouse gas. This could be controlled by composting food wastes and returning them to the land where they will greatly enrich the soil. Similarly, animal manure and human sewage that isn't recycled back into the earth also gives off methane gas. Until many cattle began to be raised in huge centralized feedlots a few years ago, farmers always used to recycle their manures because it was the richest fertilizer for the soil. Much of the nitrogen in artificial chemical fertilizers escapes into the air, where it becomes another greenhouse gas. There seems to be considerable evidence which suggests we may be well into the final perhaps less than 20 year period that marks the end of the warm interglacial and the beginning of the next ice age. John Hamaker estimates that such a rapid transition period may have begun around 1975.
based primarily on forest decline, forest fires, record cold winters, spreading drought, rising lake levels, and the steeply rising curve of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Professor Genevieve Warlard, who discovered the less than 20 year period of rapid cooling that ushered in the last ice age, wrote in 1979 that we may already be in such a transition period this time around. In other words, the next ice age could conceivably begin sometime before 1995, within the next seven years at the time this film is being made, perhaps even within the next five years. Whenever that transition occurs, the climate in the temperate regions where most of the world's food is grown will quickly get much colder. Crop freezes will occur some nights during the growing season, destroying many sources of food. Increasing high winds, hurricanes, tornadoes and hailstorms will destroy additional crops. Flooding will ruin the food crops in some areas. And increasing heat and drought, like that which destroyed some 90% of the crops in the southeast states of the U.S. in 1986, will also devastate agriculture in some areas. It'll be a total loss. Widespread drought occurs when the rain which normally falls in some tropical and temperate regions is picked up by high winds and carried closer to the poles. Hamaker believes that as a result of these combined devastations, the majority of people on Earth in every region may die of starvation in less than a decade and that the long 15-year drought in northern Africa, which has already resulted in so much starvation, is only the beginning of what may become the greatest holocaust in the history of the planet. Is there anything we can do about our rapidly deteriorating climate and the coming ice age? Incredible as it may sound, if a greenhouse effect driven by the gradual loss of soil minerals and the consequent decline of the Earth's vegetation, is in fact the long-sought engine of the Ice Ages. We may have it within our power not only to slow down the process, but to stop the cycle of Ice Ages completely. How? By doing a number of things very quickly. Stopping the clear-cutting of the Earth's forests. Greatly reducing our fossil fuel burning planting vast quantities of new trees to consume the excess carbon dioxide, and by taking over what seems to be the glacier's job and remineralizing much of the Earth's soil ourselves. Many of the Earth's temperate region forests are dying. Forest fires have also been increasing dramatically in recent years, a sign that many forests have become weakened and dried out. And we know now that dying trees and forests can usually be rejuvenated by remineralizing their soil with finely ground gravel dust. Well, maybe you notice here, uh, small trees are coming up in a sort of massive way while on the other lot of my neighbor, where there was uh, no rock dust applied, uh, almost nothing comes naturally. Uh, there are the old trees and a uh, sort of uh, bare soil, uh, needles covering the soil. Here, the variety comes back, and this means that uh, new life comes. Uh, we just have to be patient and help uh, Mother Nature to do it. When I was a little child, uh, our forests were just blooming with mushrooms. And my father used to take me out when we found lots and lots and lots. And nowadays, uh, the mushrooms have vanished almost totally. Uh, so here, you have an example that they are coming back. And I'm uh, very glad about that because it's a sure sign that the whole system is starting again.
most important thing for rock dust for agriculture is the fineness. The problem in this natural park is that not only the big trees are dying, even the young trees died about five, six years after being planted here. And in these five, six years, this, these trees had a very small growth. You see, this is the growth of the first five years of living of this tree. And 1983, we brought first time uh, the rock dust here. And every year, beginning from 1983, you see the much bigger growth of these trees, until 87. This tree was at seven, eight years at this height. In the following four and a half years, the tree reached this growth. The problem in this place was that from air pollution from a copper industry very near to this place, the soil and the air was so polluted that expert thought to take away the whole soil and to bring new one to get a new forest. And we wanted to demonstrate that only with a small quantity of rock dust, the polluted soil could be regenerated. And we came here to put first time rock dust at 1983. And it was very surprising for us that even a half a year later, the trees showed the first better growing. Against the opinion of the experts, they said, there will not be any result or it will take lots of years. We are a country of about 60,000 square miles, very mountainous and very rich in forests. 44% of the surface of Austria is covered by forests. Now, the fact of these forests dying increasingly fast has really alarmed a number of people in our country. We witness now an increasing soil destruction, uh, poverty of the soil, the dying of the uh, microbes and other uh, microscopic uh, necessary animals. We have learned from scientists that the dust of rocks and gravel uh, has a very good effect in uh, re, uh, of, co re, uh, of rendering life back to, to the soil. At the moment, we feel that everything simply has to be tried and has to be done to uh, to turn the wheel around. Da sieht man das sehr schön, dass die Nadeln uh, des Zweiges mitgesteint. The needles of the tree, which was fertilized with rock uh, dust, are very strong, thick, sind. and dark green. Whereas on the other tree, the needles are much more loosely distributed and thinner and are not as intensively green in color. These are tomato plants from the same location. 
One part of the plot is fertilized with ample quantities of rock dust. The other is not. Everything else in their treatment is exactly the same. Here is another example with apple trees. This is a very sensitive type of apple known as the Cox orange. And these soils have never seen a chemical. These trees have been fertilized exclusively with rock dust. It is almost incredible that one can achieve such a result without chemical fertilizers. There are more apples in the tree than leaves. In the close-up photograph, one can see that these apples have no defects. They are without blemishes and in such an abundant supply. Man sieht hier die völlig makellosen, fehlerfreien Äpfel bei diesem reichen Behang. Das ganz wichtig ist, dass durch die Gesteinsmehlanwendung diese extremen Klimasituationen yes, yes. abgepuffert werden, ausgeglichen werden. Mm -hmm. Die Pflanze ist widerstandsfähiger mm -hmm. gegen Trockenheit und Kälte. Mm -hmm. He said the one thing that's absolutely clear and extraordinary is that when you put rock dust, that whatever climate extremes there are, the, the plants are very strong. They're not yeah. affected by climate the way okay. plants normally are. <laughs> Also wenn Sie mich fragen, warum die Gesteinsmehlanwendung bei derartigen Erfolgen, die man hier... You might ask me why fertilizing with rock dust, despite all its success, which can be proved, has progressed so slowly and is not recommended officially by our agricultural institutions and by science. The big chemical fertilizer producers do not like competition. They want business just for themselves. These chemical fertilizer producers, of course, have a strong political lobby in order to put themselves in the foreground and to push everything else into the background. Remineralizing the soils of the world's forest will not do much good, however, if we keep cutting down the forests. If we want to survive, we have to stop clear-cutting and burning the world's forests immediately, and especially the fast-growing tropical rainforests. Since most of the rainforest countries are heavily indebted to the Western powers, they are likely to be quite ready to stop the clear-cutting in exchange for appropriate reductions in their foreign debts. This formula has already proved highly successful in preserving some rainforest lands. But it means that the World Bank and other economic interests who have been profiting from the destruction of the rainforests, even directing it to a large extent, are going to have to put the survival of all of us ahead of their short-term financial gain. And because cattle raised on former rainforest lands usually end up as fast food hamburgers. There is now a worldwide boycott of all fast food outlets until our climate can be stabilized. We can rejuvenate the world's remaining forests by remineralizing them with gravel dust, ground as fine as talcum powder so it can be made use of quickly by the trees. Mineral-rich gravel dust will also buffer the soil against some of the effects of acid rain, similar to the process whereby highly acid lakes are being somewhat neutralized by spraying them with finely ground limestone. Grinding and spreading mixed gravel dust over most of the world's forest could be done within a year or two if we made an all-out effort. To be accomplished quickly, it must be done on every scale, from millions if not billions of us as individuals, to communities and localities of every size, to the most massive efforts by countries and the United Nations. The trees of the world are our best friends now, and only they can save us. And we have to quickly plant millions of square miles of new, fast-growing trees, 
on soil that we have remineralized. Especially drought resistant trees, which don't need much rain, since summers will be increasingly hot and dry. All these new trees will help consume the excess carbon dioxide in the atmosphere quickly. The most massive involvement and commitment will be necessary if we are to succeed in time. It is an enormous job, but it seems well within the capabilities of the remarkable species we have become. After a few years, we can use the new tree trunks for fuel as a renewable energy replacement for fossil fuels. By planting and consuming trees, we'll simply be recycling the carbon into and out of the atmosphere each year, so the level of carbon dioxide will not increase. Wood can produce methanol, a clean, non-polluting alcohol fuel that has even more horsepower than gasoline and diesel oil. Another clean alcohol fuel, ethanol, can be made from corn and other agricultural crops and very efficiently on remineralized soil. Racing car drivers often choose alcohol fuels over gasoline because of their greater power. Substituting clean alcohol fuels for oil will have other enormous benefits as well. We can stop competing for oil in the Persian Gulf, where most of the world's remaining oil is located, with the ever-present danger of a nuclear war over oil. The oil companies can use their tremendous refining capacity to produce clean, environmentally safe fuels. And we won't have any more of those terrible oil spills, which kill fish and birds and ruin our beaches. Methanol and ethanol spills dissolve almost harmlessly in water. We're almost out of oil anyway. Projections show that in another 20 to 30 years, almost all the world's oil will be gone. Wouldn't it be a shame to die for it now? Wood can also be used to produce methane gas, a renewable replacement for natural gas, coal and heating oil. We have to stop burning the dirtiest fuels, like coal and oil, which produce great quantities of carbon dioxide as quickly as possible. Large double glazed windows can provide most of the heat for a house throughout the year free. Window blankets keep the heat in at night. Insulation can also cut heat losses tremendously by keeping cold air out and warm air in. The sun's free energy can even be used to cool living and working spaces in the summer. Solar chimneys pull cool air from under the building and circulate it through the rooms. Other non-polluting energy sources, such as solar hot water and space heating panels, and solar photovoltaic cells and windmills to generate electricity can certainly provide the basis for a non-polluting energy future. Whether they can be widely used during this crucial transition period, though, depends on how efficiently they can be made, how much fossil fuel will be needed to manufacture them, compared to how much energy they will put out during their first year. It might be a big mistake to risk putting any unnecessary greenhouse gases into the atmosphere during the next two or three years for fear of reaching that point of no return even sooner. We can also use all the dead trees in our forest now to provide some of the minimal necessities of heat and fuel during the next three to four years until the greenhouse gases can be brought down and our newly planted trees begin to come in for a sustainable future. We won't be able to cut down any living trees for methanol for a few years. We could convert our cars almost immediately to run on natural gas or a liquid derivative of it until the new trees come in. Natural gas gives off much less carbon dioxide and other pollutants than gasoline. The conversion is very simple and inexpensive and natural gas costs less than half the price of oil. But natural gas is still a long-buried fossil fuel, 
so we had better minimize even our natural gas burning during the next few years. In other words, if we really want to survive, perhaps it's time for us to take a two or three year vacation from our energy guzzling round of life until we see which way the wind is blowing. The work of remineralizing the soil, planting trees, and providing for the necessities of life can be shared by all of us, which will leave us all a lot of free time to take a good look at the world and maybe find out a little more about who we are and what we're doing here anyway. This most urgent of crises might turn out to be the best thing we could have hoped for. Remineralizing the soil will also revolutionize our agriculture. After 10,000 years of erosion and leaching since the last ice age, agricultural soils have also become severely demineralized. Crop yields are greatly reduced from what they could be. John Hamaker estimates that we can grow several times as much food on remineralized soil than we can grow now. And all of it much better more nourishing than the food we now grow with chemicals. The high cost of chemicals is bankrupting many farmers now and helping to destroy the family farm. Crops grown on remineralized soil don't need any pesticides or other toxic chemicals because healthy crop plants, like healthy trees, are highly resistant to insects and disease. Don Weaver grew enormous heads of organic lettuce like this one in his backyard garden on soil he remineralized himself. Dan Hemingway did a little controlled study in his garden, remineralizing only one part of it. Later, he pulled up 10 carrots from each plot and laid them side by side in a flat. The remineralized carrots are several times as big. Perry Spiller, president of the Soil Association of New Zealand, suggested to his daughter, Jean Marie, that she do something on remineralization for her high school science project. The plants fertilized only with rock dust were four to five times bigger than the control plants. Larry Ephron added some gravel dust to two out of three flats of collard green seedlings and got these visible results after only a few weeks. The Australian Mineral Fertilizer Company has been producing finely ground rock dusts for use in agriculture for many years now. The minerals have made a big, big difference to the, the health of the stock. And uh, when we're bringing the sheep in, the, um, we'd have sheep that would fall over. We'd have to bring the ute behind and, and, uh, and pick up stragglers. But this year it's totally different. We've had this paddock developed for about 25 years. And, and this is the first year that we've had good lambs. Alan, walking around the paddock, I noticed these little piles of sand with mm. uh, around the manure. The, the, mm. Would I be right in thinking that that's dung beetle activity? Yes, yeah, definitely dung beetle activity. They've been working on that, and they've uh, recycled that dung into soil in, in a matter of hours, I would think. And uh, this is something we've noticed since we put the minerals on the soil. Is that? An average fleece over the years, or, or is this a better fleece? No, that's not a, a, a run of the better fleeces at all. That's just an ordinary fleece that I had lying in the shed there that I just thought I'd bring it out and show you boys today. Is it uh, better than last year, do you think? Oh, a lot by a lot. Far better. Yeah. In weight? In weight and uh, for brightness, and uh, the crimp is a lot clearer and all. Of it. This is a crop of triticale we're standing in here. Um, this side has been, has been grown on minerals and that side has been grown on double, double super. Uh, it seems to me that this side is much better, bearing in mind we've had, we're in a, in a fairly wet area. What, what would you say about that? Well, it certainly is a lot better uh, when you consider the other side uh, is not going to uh, virtually get any return, uh, where this side I'll certainly get a return, be it you know, smaller. Think you might be a long-term user of minerals? Certainly will be. I'm, no, I haven't been in favour of um, superphosphate since 1967. I haven't priced uh, superphosphate uh, for four or five mm. years. I haven't used it for four or five mm. years now, so I haven't been pricing it. But uh, 
Well, I understand the SEPA would cost around about 250 to $300 a tonne, mm. as against mineral fertilisers, about $86 a tonne. Mm. So uh, cost-wise, I can do it for a third of the price. Yeah. There's a lot more activity in the soil now. We've got crows and cockatoos operating here all the time, and uh, so we're feeding the whole environment, not just the sheep. Yeah. The stock are eating the weeds now, whereas uh, dock and cape weed used to run riot here. Uh, now the stock are eating the weeds and finding them more palatable, so I think uh, given time we'll get rid of all the weeds. Uh, the neighbour over here is spending a lot of money at the vets, uh, having his dead stock uh, analysed to see what was wrong with them. Does he ever make a comment when he sees your stock here, which are looking clean and fat and healthy? He has commented on how healthy our weaners look here, yeah. and uh, he wonders why. Yeah, I tell him why, but yeah. it doesn't seem to uh, go any further than that. It takes some people a long time for the penny to drop. This is the Zimmerli plant in Zurich, Switzerland, which is one of a dozen or more companies in Europe which have been selling rock dust fertilizers to farmers for a long time. Although there seems to be considerable evidence that supports the explanation of the ice age cycles presented here, this explanation has not yet been proven conclusively. But conclusive proof of this kind of theory might be a long way off. Can we afford to wait? At some point, perhaps very soon, the processes described here may become irreversible and then nothing we could do would make any difference. Even if we were to begin tomorrow to do everything that needs to be done, however, and are ultimately successful in stopping the next ice age, the climate might still be increasingly severe for the next few years until some of the excess carbon dioxide can be taken out of the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect begins to subside. So we also need to begin stockpiling food, especially staple foods like grains and legumes, to get us through the next few years safely. The only way we can quickly build up worldwide food reserves enough is by remineralizing farm soil which will bring much higher yields within a year or two. It will help if we stop feeding so much of our grains to cattle and other animals and reduce our meat eating for a while. We also need to quickly build as many solar greenhouses as possible. and use protective plastic coverings wherever they are needed to give our food crops additional protection against summer freezes, high winds, and hail. An attached solar greenhouse will also heat much of the house at the same time. But if we do not turn things around in time, we are not likely to have enough greenhouses or enough irrigation water for most of us to survive. And if there is less and less food to go around, we may start killing each other over it so it seems like we'd better recognize very quickly what may well be happening and start as soon as possible to do everything we can to bring the greenhouse gases down to safe levels. Some people will say things like, if the ice age is coming, we shouldn't try to stop it. It's what nature intends. It's God's will. But maybe this ultimate crisis is a message from nature, or God, or the universe, or whatever you call the unknown that's bigger than we are, 
that it's time for us supposedly intelligent creatures to stop destroying this beautiful place we live. And if we get the message and act on it in time, we will perhaps have evolved to a higher level of consciousness. And maybe we'll be ready finally to coexist respectfully with our neighbors, the countless other plant and animal beings we share this planet with. Have we got the guts to do it? How much do we really want to be here? You can find out much more about this global emergency and what we can do about it in the book, The End, The Imminent Ice Age and How We Can Stop It, published by Celestial Arts. It's really a handbook for our survival. You can call toll-free 1-800-441-7707. In California, please call 415-524-2700. Copies of this film are also available in VHS or beta, together with a summary of the ideas and evidence.